we're going to continue our study. We've been studying through the book of Matthew, and we're going to invite you to Matthew chapter 10. We're going to talk about how Jesus sends out some workers because he's getting ready to start spreading his influence in this kingdom of God that he's introducing to people. And we're going to get to that section where if you read it at first glance, you would see what Jesus says to a particular Canaanite woman, and you would think, did he just give her an insult? That doesn't sound like Jesus at all. And we're going to explore that a little bit and find out what do we do when we encounter a verse like that? How can we find out what he really meant? And then we're going to find out what he really meant. So let's look at Matthew 10, starting at verse 1. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And these are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who's called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, James and John, the sons of thunder, we learn about elsewhere, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, or Levi, as we learned earlier, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now these twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions, do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel, and as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead. That particular phrase, raise the dead, was added in much later manuscripts, so some scholars wonder if that was original or not. We're not sure. Cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. Don't get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. In other words, pack light. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. And as you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it's not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off of your feet. Truly I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. May the Lord add clarity and purpose to the reading of his word. So what was the mission of the twelve? as we start looking back through there for a few highlights. The mission, quite simply, was this, to announce the coming kingdom. Christ had arrived. He was there because he was there. The kingdom was beginning to take shape, but it wouldn't really be ushered in until after the death, burial, resurrection, and we ascended to be with his Father. So the coming kingdom, and to further validate Jesus' authority and identity. Man, this one's just like Matthew is going, I want you to get it. I want you to get it. I want you to get it. And so he keeps putting this out there. Everything that's coming up to us right now is to validate Jesus' identity and his authority. So why 12 people? Why did he choose 12? Well, for one thing, he prayed about it, and God the Father told him, I want you to pick these guys. But also, I think there's a strong symbolism here probably. Most scholars would agree with that. There are 12 tribes of Israel, were there not? And it seems like Israel has become this wonderful illustration to all of us believers about how God interacts with his people. And so he ties a lot of his things into working with the children of Israel. So why the Jews first? This was really perplexing. When I first started reading through this, I have known this story often enough, but when you read something, you read it, when it smacks you the first time you read it, sometimes you think, well, that seems kind of exclusive, doesn't it? Why wouldn't God just give instructions to Jesus to say, go out and tell everybody you meet that the kingdom of God is coming? But instead, he gave specific instructions to go to the Jews first. Well, I put on Facebook earlier in the week, when I encounter something that I'm not quite sure what's going on there, chances are there's something back, perhaps even in the Old Testament, that God is fulfilling. If I go looking for that, Chances are really good God's going to show me what he had in mind because Jesus was constantly fulfilling what God had told him to do, sometimes several hundred years before he did it. That's precisely the case in Matthew 10. Jesus doesn't shy away from talking with Samaritans. He doesn't go out of his way to snub them. If he sees a Samaritan, like the woman at the well, he doesn't say, hey, you're a Samaritan. I don't want to have anything to do with you. But he also doesn't specifically tell his 
disciples or becoming apostles to go into this specific Samaritan town. He's waiting for the right time because God the Father was showing him in his good time when is the right time to fulfill all these things. And I suspect that there probably would have been some problems had he gone immediately to the Gentiles and especially to the Samaritans or the Canaanites. He starts first with the Jews. What if he had started sending the twelve to the Gentiles? Well, if you think about it realistically, there was such hatred and animosity, like what uh, we had learned about going to Haiti between those who were in the Dominican Republic and those Haitians. Just a huge cultural rift between them. If that had been the case, chances are, if they had gone to the Gentiles first and then shown up at the Jewish synagogue, they would have known that they were showing themselves to the Gentiles first, and they probably wouldn't have wanted to have anything to do with them. So part of it may have been practical in nature, and he's saying we want to build the bridges first, but I also think that God recognize something in Jesus' character and with him being the good shepherd that comes into play here. He instructs his apostles to go to the lost sheep of Israel. You see that in verse 6. Remember something back in Matthew 9 that we'd studied just a few weeks ago? 9.36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like what without a shepherd? Like sheep. This was more fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies, and he saw these sheep without a shepherd. He is the good shepherd, and so certainly he's going to be going to those lost sheep first, because they'd been scattered. Remember the 12 tribes had been scattered? The kingdom was falling apart. It had been divided into two sections, and then the 10 go off here. So all that's happening, and it's right at the time when Jesus is supposed to start fulfilling all this stuff, and it converges in this very short amount of time. It's almost like all these lines that are drawn. I see in my mind this picture of one of those maps of the United States, and you see the, the airliners where they fly to. And when they fly to the hub, you know, they get down to Atlanta, for example. It just gets really thick there. If you could draw all these lines from all these other areas of Scripture, they would converge, many of them, right here in these passages of Scripture in the Gospel because God is starting to converge all this stuff that He planned way ahead of time. Look at Isaiah. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be His servant, to bring Jacob back to Him and gather Israel to Himself. Who are they talking about? This is Jesus. He says, It is too small... Now, Check this out. I love this. It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. Say what? It is too small a thing? Wouldn't it have been a huge thing for Jesus to fulfill just that much of the prophecy and to bring back all those people in Israel that God has kept for himself? That would have been a huge thing. But he says, no, that's too small. I've got bigger plans. Like when we went to Haiti with our mission team, we thought we were planning big because Mark Sturk and our missionary said, yeah, we'll probably have as many as 30, maybe 40. So we thought, okay, we're going to show them. We're going to plan for a 50. <laughs> blah ha ha We ran out of certificates because 55 pastors came and showed it. When God plans something, it's much bigger than the way we can think because he's awesome. Amen. <laughs> and he's amazing. And so he says, it's too small a thing. So what else is bigger than that? Well, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. How many of us here are Gentiles today? Just about all of us. That's a really good verse for us. Because he wanted to spread his good news about the kingdom to everybody, starting with the Jews first, because they were the lost sheep. But he wanted to spread that to all of us. We're beneficiaries of that. I'm really grateful for that. So that gives us a peek into God's heart and the scope and goal that he had in mind. He's a global kind of God. Of course, he should be because he kind of made the world, so he should be global. We get some clarity. This is something I I like. I'm going to camp out on this for a little bit. In fact, I was listening to Tom's message on MP3 because it's on our website from when our team was in Haiti, and he started by saying, I saw this little tiny amount of scripture in there, and I thought, wow, I, I can't possibly get enough information to be able to spend 30 or 40 minutes on this topic. And then I started studying it and seeing the richness growing out of these verses. And I thought, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through this in in time. That's exactly what happened with this bunch of stuff. And in fact, I pushed off about half of what I was going to present today till next week. Aren't you glad? (laughs) Otherwise, we'd be here till two o'clock. And so we can't do that. So I'm going to camp out on this because we see clarity in chapter 15, looking back at chapter 10. And I love it to see where You see these things folded together the way God does, and it just makes it become three-dimensional. Verse 21 of chapter 15, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. That place was a Jewish region. Tyre and Sidon were in a Gentile region. So this is later than what's happening 
at the time he's going to be looking at chapter 10. You with me here? I've just fast-forwarded chronologically in time a little bit where he's ready to start extending that into the Gentile territory. And a Canaanite woman, this is verse 22, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David. Where have we heard that before? Remember the blind guys? Son of David, have mercy on us. They knew something. They had some special spiritual insight because son of David was something that implied messiahship. And she says, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Remember now that Jesus always does things intentionally, right? So when he does something and we think, well, how rude. He's doing something intentional. Look what he does. Verse 23, Jesus did not answer a word. And we might think, Lord, this woman's in trouble. What are you doing ignoring her? You're going to see some other pieces of this puzzle come together that just blew me away when I started to see it. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. She's such a bother. Lord, why don't you send her away? Verse 24, he answered, I was sent only to the of Israel. Here we see this phrase coming up again. Remember that? So he's been talking about how he's going to do everything according to the way God wants him to do it as he spreads the kingdom. He's going to go to the Jews first. Now he goes to this other region. You know what was being taught about in the first 20 verses leading right up to that? We'll see it in just a minute. (laughs) Verse 25, the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. She's doing for him exactly what his parable about the widow and the unjust judge was about and talking about persistence. She was persistent. Even though Jesus appeared to be ignoring her and the disciples were saying, send him away, she says, Lord, help me, please. She recognizes that he's got something that she needs. So she recognizes his authority and she says, son of David, which was a big deal. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. How could you have just insulted her that way? Did you just insinuate that this woman from Canaan is a dog? Yes. But there's more to be seen in why he uses a certain word for dog, and we're going to see that in a second. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Ooh. She's showing some insight here, and we're going to unpack this because it's really fascinating. And then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. And we're going, (laughs) how does she exhibit great faith by saying, oh, yes, it is, because even the dogs eat the crumbs. And we're all going, this doesn't make sense to me. It will. Trust me, it's going to make so much sense in just a minute. And her daughter was healed at that moment because he granted her request. Cool story, right? But now. Did Jesus just insult her? No. That's not according to his character. If we see something in Scripture that sounds like it's outside of God's character, we need to find out what intentionality is he exhibiting here. He's doing something on purpose, and it's got to fall within his character. He doesn't just flippantly run around whimsically dissing people and offering racial slurs or calling people dogs or wolves or whatever. He did call some Pharisees whitewashed sepulchers, and a brood of vipers, but they deserved it. (laughs) That wouldn't be in his character. So let's look for the reason for his choice of words. The Jews referred to Gentiles often as those dogs, and they meant unclean junkyard dogs. We would think of them as like a junkyard dog, you know, this mongrel that's out there, and if you get too close and you start to get close to that dog's food, what's that dog going to do? he's going to tear and rip you to part. And that's exactly what the Jews referred to the Gentiles as, because they were unclean. They were all worried about defilement. What's going to defile me and make me ceremonially unclean? And these dogs are unclean. Okay, That's a part of this big thing that factors in here. We see in Matthew 7 and 6, where does this sound familiar from? Don't give to the dogs what is sacred, and this is like that junkyard dog style of dog. That's the Greek word that means junkyard dog. I'm using that as an Americanism there. Do not throw your pearls to the pigs or the swine. If you do, they may trample them under their feet like the dogs would do if you'd throw them out or the pigs would do if you just throw the pig slop on the ground. They didn't care if they're stomping all over it and eating it. They don't care. He says, they may turn and tear you to pieces. There's a good principle that's happening here, but we see a big juxtaposition, huge contrast between what he's saying to this lady, the Canaanite, and what he said back here at the Sermon on the Mount. 
Jews didn't even want to be seen in the same room with the Gentiles. How do we know that? Because back when uh, Jesus was being given those mock trials in John 18, 28, the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace. This would have been on Friday, so they're getting ready to have the Sabbath. They didn't enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. Why would they not be able to eat the Passover if they'd gone into the palace? They would have been unclean because they'd been in presence of those dogs, the Gentiles. You see how legalistic and serious they were about this stuff? I mean, when they're talking dogs, they meant to stay away from the dogs. Jesus purposefully exposed prejudice and legalism. Constantly he's doing that, especially in front of his disciples. And he really despised this legalism that resulted in such prejudice. And he's about to do that because he's been talking about what defiles a person in chapter 15, and he's getting ready to just knock their socks off. Well, they had sandals, so I don't know if they had socks. Anyway, the conversation with this Canaanite woman took place in Gentile territory. That was intentional. The context for his incident in the first 20 verses is Jesus teaching about what defiles a person. That was intentional. So it's no accident that he goes right from teaching. It's not what the outside that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of your heart that matters. You can put something in your mouth and it can be unclean, but it's just passed along through your waist and no big deal. He said, but what's in your heart? That's what matters the most. That's how you get really defiled. And then he walks from there and who should approach them but this Canaanite woman. Bing, 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 bing. Timing. God is really good at coming up with just the right incidents to show us what he's got up his sleeve. And Jesus is going to show us and demonstrate for his disciples so that they can clearly understand what truly defiles a person and what doesn't. And he's going to start expanding the kingdom into the Gentile territories. Jesus explained his priorities in a way that both the woman would get it and his disciples would clearly get it. He was like, okay, guys, listen up. There's going to be a test. I want you to see how I interact with this woman because you're going to start to understand what I just talked to you about in the first 20 verses. He didn't have 20 verses, but what I just talked about leading up to this point. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel, he says to this woman. Now, if Jesus took his attention away from Israel by focusing on the Gentiles too early in his ministry, he would have been violating his mission that God had given him. So he's being obedient, as he always was. But the woman comes and kneels down before him, and she basically badgers him and says, hey, I'm not leaving. I'm right here in front of you. You need to help me. Do something to help me, because I know you've got the authority to do so. And he replies, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the Dogs. What's the word for dogs he uses here? Something that we totally miss in English that we didn't get in Greek. And I think it's a shame that they didn't, the translators didn't work a little harder to give some description for that. But I wouldn't want to be in the job of trying to translate. It, that would be tough. The dogs here that they're using is the little puppy dog, a lap dog, a pet dog. Something that would not have been lost on this Canaanite woman. She probably would have been aware that the Jews called Samaritans and the Canaanites and Gentiles those dogs. And I wonder if Jesus might have even raised an eyebrow and said it with a wry twist in his voice a little bit to say, well, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the puppy dogs. Changes everything when you understand that one word. Because you've got this one thing back in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, don't take what's sacred, Don't take what's holy and toss it to the dogs, the junkyard dogs. Don't toss your pearls before the swine. They may turn and tear you up. And all of a sudden, he's using a little bit of a flipped phrase here. He flips it on its head. And I think this woman was shrewd enough and smart enough to pick up on some of the subtlety because she gets it. Jesus often tested people to determine their intentions. Have you noticed that when he interacts with people? He'll see people coming like Nathaniel and say, where is this man's guile? He's so honest. He's not hiding anything. He's just putting it right out there. Jesus would test people with what he would say. Sometimes he would question them. With the rich young ruler, he would say, why don't you go and sell all of your possessions and give to the poor and then come follow me? Well, he was testing his intention. He does this with this woman too. Her response showed that this Gentile woman knew that she was being told that Jesus should serve the Jews first. I think she got it. I think she understood what he was saying. She says, yes, but it is right, Lord, because even the dogs, the pet dogs, and she uses the same word for pet dogs that he had just used, even the little lap dogs, 
can eat the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table, from the master's table. That was important. She was saying, yeah, give it to the Jews first. That's great. And they have this wealth of information. They have the Old Testament prophecies. They have everything going for them. But even we pet dogs should be able to get the crumbs that fall off of their table if they miss it first. And that's exactly what Jesus is starting to show his apostles. Let's go for those who should know it, but if they reject it, let's just not say, okay, our job's done. Let's go to the Gentiles after that. And Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And at that same time, then he healed her daughter. The healing was almost secondary. He was really talking about his authority and his identity. And then the healing came even after that. So Jesus' principle is made clear. Don't cast your pearls before swine is a contrast to what Jesus tells this Canaanite woman. He doesn't want the apostles who are starting to share the kingdom with other people to go to people who will just turn around and trample them like some of the Pharisees would do. I mean, they've got their minds completely, thoroughly mixed up and permanently set like concrete. And so he says, go ahead and try that. But like he's telling them to go out into these villages, if they won't hear you, wipe the dust off of your feet. They would literally do that. It was a sign to say that even that can be defiled, and we don't want to carry that defilement with us. So if they won't listen to you, go elsewhere. It's going to be worse for them than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah. And guess what happened to those two cities? It didn't end well for them. So we got this pet dogs contrasted with unclean dogs, and I love it to see how these two fold together to show us the contrast because we catch some of Jesus' gracious heart. The dogs in Jesus' teaching from the Sermon on the Mount represent those who would reject and mock the gospel. Was this lady rejecting the gospel? Not at all. She was so open to Jesus. In fact, she recognized his authority. So he says, yeah, the pet dogs deserve the graciousness of God as well. If they're willing to listen, even if they come from a people group that we've despised, we need to give them the gospel. Cleanliness of the heart was Jesus' point. It was the point for all of chapter 15, and he really drives that point home in his interaction with this woman. So what does this mean to us? First of all, Jesus knows the disposition of our hearts. Outward observances don't make us eligible to eat the living bread. Man, there's so many of those... And I don't want to cast dispersion on good traditional churches because I grew up in one. And God used that in a big way. But I saw so much hypocrisy in some of the churches that could be so legalistic that they would miss even some of this point. They would substitute some of God's good teaching and develop their own forms of legalism without even realizing they were doing that. And Jesus really wants us to get it because if we're not careful, even we can develop forms of legalism. You have to have the same order of service every week. You have to be baptized in a certain location or with a certain temperature of water. I mean, you know, I'm being silly here, but you get the point. It's easy for us to start substituting legalism of man-made outward symbols of righteousness and forget that our hearts are what God's really interested in. The disposition of our heart, that's where this cleanliness is going to come from. And if we have a, a broken and contrite spirit that says, God, I'm just, I'm worth nothing without you. I don't deserve anything from you other than just grace, and you've given it to me freely. So help me to just receive your grace and not try to earn all this stuff by doing all my legalistic, busy, Christianese activity. Secondly, when Jesus doesn't give us an immediate answer to something, if we're really wrestling through something, even if we're reading lots of Scripture and we're praying about it, and it's just not becoming clear yet, he hasn't given us that firm answer, or he hasn't given us what we've really been asking for, Maybe, and I think this is an appropriate application from how he dealt with some of the passage that we've just looked at. I think maybe he may be trying to determine our intent. You know, like what he did with the woman, he he didn't answer her right away. He may have been just waiting to see, is she going to be persistent with me or not? What's her real intent? Is she just wanting to approach me because she just desperately wants me to heal her daughter and she really doesn't respect me for who I really am? Or does she get it? Does she understand that I'm the son of David? I am the coming Messiah. I'm the one who was prophesied. And she clearly got it. There have been a few things in my lifetime that I've just prayed relentlessly. I mean, I just didn't give up on it. I kept praying about it and saying, God, why don't you give this to me? I just, I feel like I'm deserving of it. And it's like his silence was sort of Jesus looking at me like, well, what's your motive? 
What's your intent? Are you trying to use me like a slot machine? I'm going to go to church on Sunday. Click. I'm going to go to a prayer meeting in the middle of the week. Click. I'm going to host a small group. Click. I'm going to go work at the Hope Clinic this week. Click. I'm going to go on a mission trip. Click. Ching. Hey, I should get what? I didn't get it. I'm not a slot machine. You can't just do A, B, C, and D and expect this other thing in return. You have to trust me, and you have to be in relationship with me. It's not about outward observances. Do I want the purity of the heart? Yes, and the purity of the heart will lead you to do some of these other spiritual disciplines, but you don't do the disciplines just so you can get stuff from me. That's not the way it works. And third, in our reaches to other people, recognizing everyone and communicating his hope, we can learn to discern between which kind of dog are we dealing with. That's a terrible phrase for it. I wouldn't advise using that when you speak to somebody. Pardon me, but I've determined that you're the junkyard dog, and I don't want to have anything to do with you. Don't recommend it. Don't think they'll understand. But there may be times when we can see that the wall goes up. I know some of you have asked for prayer because you have family members that just don't get it yet. And you want them to because you love what God has done for you. And you want them to have that same joy and satisfaction and that eternal hope that you have. But you feel like that there's this wall that goes up when you try to talk with them about it because you feel like, oh, she's just judging me or he's just judging me. Every time they're around, I feel like they're looking at me judgmentally because of my lifestyle. And you haven't done a thing. It's just their perception. Sometimes if the wall goes up, it's time to back off and keep praying and showering them with grace. Just like Jesus did. I mean, he just showered us with a lot of grace and sometimes we still don't get it, but he just keeps showing grace until finally the time is right. Unfortunately, I've seen this far too often, sometimes it takes a crisis, I mean a serious crisis, to get people to a point where they're willing to open up and say, wow, maybe I should be open to hearing about this God you're talking about. And you would pray that it doesn't take that, but sometimes that's what it takes. But we need to be discerning in how we deal with the people we're dealing with. If you see somebody who says, you know, I'm really open to talking about this stuff, and they start asking you good questions Wow, just like this Canaanite person. They may be from a very different background than you would have expected. That's okay. God wants you to share the real gospel about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and what it means to you in a way that's winsome and relational with this person. You may be shocked at what God's been preparing that person for, and you may be just the person to have that spiritual conversation with them. It's cool when that happens. I want us to pray a little bit. And I'm going to ask that you would start looking for that little spirit-led antenna that would go up this week so that we can watch to see if maybe God would enter into some what would normally be just average everyday conversations and turn, turn them into something more spiritual on a deeper level. Let's ask for that. Let's pray together. Father, we can see by the way Jesus interacted with people that he, he submitted to you, his heavenly Father, even though he was God. And so there's this wonderful, willing submission of roles that he's playing as God the Son. And yet he's still God. And so we get to see how you are interacting with people by showing us through Jesus' life. And we thank you for that. Thank you for making yourself visible through Jesus so we can get you. And I thank you that he was discerning enough through the Spirit's leadership, through your leadership, Father, that He would understand how to teach a lesson and make it indelible for his apostles. And now we get to benefit from that. We get to understand that sometimes there are people who are just going to put up that wall. They don't want to have anything to do at all with Jesus talk or church talk. And if so, we need to know when to just back off and pray for them and try to be as loving as we can. But we want to be really available. And this is where we want to pray this week, Father, that you'll just... Make us super in tune, like on the same wavelength. And your spirit will prompt us so that if a conversation needs to go deeper and we sense that somebody's going through something and they're willing to talk on a spiritual level, help us to be that person who can talk openly about what Jesus means to us. We don't have to make it clunky and weird. We don't have to have a pre-arranged, pre-memorized plan of presentation like we're selling a car. We can just be ourselves. And I pray that we'll be that. And as you live in us through your Holy Spirit, that it's okay because you'll prompt us where to talk, where to go, and you'll show us through your word, which hopefully we have enough of it growing in our hearts and minds that you'll bring to mind exactly what we need to say and how to say it. 
I pray that we'll all be much more sensitive to having these kinds of talks with folks and that these spiritual conversations will begin, begin to bear fruit. And we thank you for that. Thank you that you are doing the work and that we're simply your vessels. Again, we don't want to turn it into some outward observance and put a notch in our Bible for every person we witness to. It's not about outward observance. We just want you to inhabit our hearts. And we want that outflow from our hearts to represent you in such a natural way, like springs of living water. May we be artesian wells this week. I pray in Jesus' name.